Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. Guide us in this text. There is so much here. Open truths in our heart that we may not have seen before. Help us to understand. Help us to to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there was a there's a period in my life where I just stopped doing my homework. I, I don't I was really young, a, a young child, and I don't really remember a, a whole lot about that season of my life. But I do remember some of the things that kind of fed into my reasoning behind stopping my homework. I, I just remember a sense of overwhelming stress about my homework, about understanding what I was supposed to do, getting it right, and turning it in, and remembering to do it in the first place. And it just created this stress in my life, and I remember every night just really just sitting in like, oh, tears sometimes, and, and just emotional, just like, ah. And so my solution was brilliant. I would just stop doing it. I would just pretend that it didn't even exist. And so I switch, flipped a little switch in my brain, and poof, all my homework was gone, magically. And let me tell you, it was great. It was, the stress was immediately, like, it was gone. The stress was no longer there. Stress, no longer there. Worry, no longer there. My afternoons were free. I had suddenly hours worth of time in the afternoons where I could frolic and, and have fun and do all the things that I wanted to do in the first place, but I'd always been tied to my homework. My book bag got much lighter. In fact, some days, I didn't even have to carry it with me. It was great. It was great. Now, if you are a kid and you're in here listening to this and you're thinking, man, that's a great solution. It is not a great solution. It is not a great solution. Don't try it. Because the, the, the interesting thing for those around, who have been around and have a lot of wisdom of age is just because you pretend that you don't have homework, just because you pretend that you don't have a responsibility doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility. You can't just say suddenly, I'm going to stop paying bills because they don't exist. Because they do. No matter what you think in your mind, doesn't make that a reality. And the truth is, we have responsibilities. If you're a kid, you have homework. If you're an adult, you have bills and jobs. And no matter how much we don't want them, they're still there. There are things in the Bible that, frankly, make me uncomfortable. When I see them, I will read really quickly through them. There are pictures in the Bible of God that aren't my favorite. There are concepts that I don't fully understand, but what I do understand about them sometimes terrify me. Sometimes there's things that I see and I understand, and they just kind of grate against my nerves, against my sensibilities. There are commands that I don't really want to follow. And I think that's true of everyone. When I say that God is, nine times out of ten, you're going to say love or merciful. Which is true, and it is right. But there are other things that the Bible says that God is that we just kind of gloss over or smooth away. God is jealous. God judges. God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. And to stand in his presence in the Old Testament is to be completely undone, completely destroyed. In Deuteronomy 6, we just said that today, we are told to love the Lord our God with, all, with everything. And just a few verses more later, we're told in Deuteronomy 6, 13, fear the Lord your God. So love and fear 
We can get behind the love thing. The fear thing kind of sends us for a loop sometimes. We like a God who is love. We like the command to love. But the God who judges? Sometimes it's like if we just pretend that it's not there, then it doesn't exist. And we can go about our lives happily deluded, not bearing any kind of weight or responsibility. But the problem is, is that it doesn't get rid of it. Just because we ignore something or refuse to acknowledge something doesn't mean that it isn't there. What we believe has to align with what is actually there, what is actually truth, or we are just delusional. We can talk about the fact that God is love. He is. And we can live in that all we want. But if we don't acknowledge that God's love doesn't release us from obedience, but calls us to a costly obedience, then we will miss the reality, the truth of who God is. And why that matters is because of uh, our, our text today. It's a hard text. I know it's going to grate against our sensibilities. It starts off with God commanding Abraham to kill his son Isaac. In our modern sensibilities, we, we don't like to hear it. It's jarring. It's hard. God calls Abraham to a level of obedience that is mind-boggling. I can't even fathom that. I can't think about it without just shaking. And we struggle with it. And we really, I think, need to sit in it. We really need to not read quickly through it and not get to the part where God jumps in and, and relieves Abraham of the responsibility of obedience. To really, really understand. Because when Abraham, when God appears to Abraham and calls him to, to sacrifice his son, Abraham doesn't know what's going to happen. The level of obedience that God calls Abraham to is extraordinary. And at some level it seems to be unfair. I mean, there's other things that God has called Abraham to. To leave his home, to go to a faraway nation... To trust him. And he's done okay with that. But now. If you've been following the reading plan. This week. Then you will see that. We've kind of traced and, and gone with Abraham. As he's kind of traveled through life. And he's hit this point in his life. Where, where he seems to be quite comfortable. He has land. He has a bunch of property. A bunch of animals. He is at peace with his neighbors. He's secured a, a, a name for himself. It seems that he's, he, people are kind of afraid of him. He seems to be a, 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 a strong warrior. All the things that, that would bring uh, clout during that time. All the things that a person would need. And he's proven over and over again that, he's, that he is obedient. He's followed God and except for maybe a couple of of small hiccups that he has corrected, he has been faithful. And God has told him multiple times that he's going to bless Abraham. And through him and his son, that God is going to bless all of the world. In Genesis 15, Abraham's got it. He's got it all. He's, he's pretty wealthy. He's blessed. And God has said, I'm going to continue to bless you. I'm going to continue to look out for you. I'm going to continue to take care of you. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to be your shield. I'm going to be your reward. And rather than praising God and thanking God for that, Abraham goes, woe is me. Woe is me. I, I still, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. You've, yeah, you give me those other things. But you have given me no children. So a servant in my house will be my heir. 
He wants a son more than anything else. A son who he can, he can pass his property on, a, a son that he can pass his name on to. And his, his ability to have kids is pretty much in the rearview mirror. In fact, it's so far in the rearview mirror that we are told Sarah, Abraham's wife, decides that she might help the process a little bit, and she tells Abraham to sleep with one of her servants, Hagar. That's a whole other sermon. So that he can have an heir. And he does that. But God tells Abraham that that isn't the answer. He promises him a son. And that that son will come through Abraham and be born by Sarah. And in Genesis 21, he makes an even more specific promise. He says that the world would be blessed through his son Isaac. That God is going to do amazing things through this son. And through it all, God has stood behind his promise. And Abraham has learned to trust God in a way that is pretty amazing. But now, now God calls Abraham to a level of obedience that is just unparalleled. God says, take your son, your only son whom you love, and, and sacrifice him on the mountain that I show you. This command doesn't make sense. What about the promise? What about this great gift that God has given to Abraham? There's a tension here. A tension between God's promise and God's command. And Abraham has a choice to make. Cling to what he has, this son, who is the most precious thing in his life, or act in obedience. Now he could choose to rationalize it. He could decide that God is love and his command is inconsistent with that. He could play mental gymnastics and decide that God doesn't really mean sacrifice his son. He can decide that God's command is figurative or metaphorical or whatever, but not literal and just not do it. He could even just be honest and say, Okay, God, I know you're calling me to this thing, this thing that you asked me to do, and it, it's just too hard. I can't do it. I can't, I can't let go of my son. He could do all of those things. Every act of obedience from every human being in all of history is in some ways just like this. Obedience is costly. If it costs us nothing, then it probably isn't obedience. Thou shalt not murder is real easy until you're faced with the possibility that you might commit murder or the reason to commit murder. Some of God's other commands. The command not to lie is tested when we are asked if this dress makes me look too fat. Or when we... We reach that age when we think we are smarter than our parents. And the command to honor them seems so hard. When Jesus calls people to follow him, there are things he calls us to leave behind, to give up. And many times, those things don't make sense. In the world we live in, it makes no sense to give our money away. But we, we are called to nonetheless. It makes no sense to love our enemies... But that is what Jesus calls us to. It makes no sense to, ma to live moral and upright lives when so many people seem to be getting ahead and having tons of fun at the same time by doing the exact opposite. That is the decision all of us are faced with in our lives. Is God God or not? If He is God... The, the things he calls us to, whether they are hard or easy, we have to trust that he knows what he is doing. The knee jerk is to do the opposite. God calls us to faithfulness. But this thing over here seems good, and it seems right, so I'll walk in that way. A man's ways seems right to himself. 
God gives us a path that he wants to walk, wants us to walk on. The right way, the way that is true. And that will not always be aligned with what we want to do. Tim Keller used to say that you cannot expect to follow God and never have to do something that you don't want to do. That if you follow God, and the God that you follow never disagrees with you, then you aren't following God, you are actually following yourself, and that's no God at all. And that's hard. At its baseline, God has picked the hardest thing that Abraham can do. God has picked the, uh, uh, to sacrifice his son, the one he loves that we're told, his only son. And Abraham is obedient. Probably the hardest thing he ever had to do. He is obedient as we see in verse 3. He got up, he gathered his crew, he cut some wood and he set out. But he's also hopeful. He's hopeful that there's a part of the plan that he... That he doesn't see, that he doesn't understand, that God sees and that God understands. And so it gives him a a kind of hope. And in verse 5 we see that. He says to his servants, stay here with the donkey. We, meaning he and his son, will go worship and we will return. And he goes. So why does God call Abraham to sacrifice his son? We see at the very beginning of this text, at the very beginning of this passage, that God tested Abraham. He tests him. Every time that we are faced with a choice between obedience and disobedience, it is a test. Will my faith stand up under this test? Will I choose the thing that I want Or will I choose the thing that God wants? It is a time of testing and trial. There's a show on the History Channel. It's called Forged in Fire. It's a guilty pleasure I have, so don't judge me. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then you're just wondering what it is. But it's like these smiths get together, like forging smiths, get together, and they compete to create like these blades. And they they have to make swords and knives and whatever, axes. And they have to make those things. And, And sometimes they make these incredible looking Uh, weapons these swords and knives and axes they make these incredible looking things and they they look so pretty and nice but the tension comes when after they're done creating it they have to stand before these weapons testers and they take these swords and they test them and and they test them to see if they are are good weapons if they actually do what they're designed to do and that when they know that they've 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 tested the weapons, they've hit like metal and pottery and all kinds of crazy stuff, which is kind of fun to watch. They hit all this stuff, and they make sure that the weapons that have been built do the things that they're supposed to do. Under pressure, does it work? This is a time of testing for Abraham. Will he actually, in obedience, do this thing that God commands? And we see that he does. Without hesitation or argument, he is obedient to what God commands. And we don't know fully what he went through, what's in his mind. I can, I can imagine that night that there's agony, there's probably tears. But he sets about to do what God has asked him to do. But we do know, we do know that he did it. Or that he set out to do it. And the writer of Hebrews gives us a hint of his thought process in Hebrews 11, verse 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. 
He considered the possibility that God was going to answer his promise in a way that Abraham had not figured before. That God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham didn't think that God had changed his mind. He didn't fathom that God would stop him or that God would give him another heir. He knew that God could carry out his promise in the most dramatic of ways. That if he was commanded to do this thing, then God could raise his son from the dead. Pastor Joe told me something this week as we talked about this passage. And I really, really liked it and just kind of went over and over again in my mind. That when you doubt God's hands, trust his heart. That you can trust that God will be faithful even when you cannot see that faithfulness. And what he is giving to you in that particular moment. That is what Abraham does here. He sees the test that God's hands have given. He's experiencing it. But he's hopeful that God's heart will fulfill his promise. We will all face those moments of testing. We will all go through stuff. If you think about it, most of the men and women, faithful men and women in the Bible went through some crazy stuff. We see their faithfulness in their testing, actually. We understand their faithfulness by the stuff that they go through. Job went through a time of testing. His children were killed. He lost all of his, all of his possessions on earth, his health, everything. He lost it all. It was a test. We just came out of Advent and Christmas. Mary went through stuff, if you think about it. When the angel appeared and told her that she would have a child, she was going to face the thing that unmarried women faced when you came in a, got a pregnancy at that time when you weren't married and yet in faithfulness she said in luke chapter one she said in luke chapter one verse 38 i am the lord's servant may it be to me as you have said She faced Jesus in the New Testament. He faced some stuff. He knows what's coming in his life. And three times in Mark, boom, one after the other. In chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, Jesus says, The Son of Man, meaning himself, is going to be lifted up, crucified, suffer." Yet he trusted God's faithfulness. We will go through trials. We will go through tests. And the challenge in our own lives is to maintain faithfulness through it all. Some of us will go through it more than others. Some times of life are are harder and heavier than others. And not everything we go through is going to be that, that Abrahamic kind of level of a test. But we will face it. The early church, they understood life to be a test of faithfulness. Peter wrote in 1 Peter, verses 6 through 7, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even when refined by fire, may be proved genuine. And may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Walter Brueggemann, a former Old Testament professor at Columbia, writing about faithfulness and testing, says it makes clear, talking about Genesis 22, it makes clear the deep conflict between the purposes of God and the purposes of this age. In any time and place, there will be conflict. And times of testing are inescapable. Whenever we are faced with a decision, do we trust God or not? Do we believe in the deeper part of God's promise, His heart? Or do we judge based upon what we see happening, His hand? To believe the deeper part 
promise is hard. It is something that requires a trust that is enormous. Experience gives us that trust. And it's built up over a lifetime. It's often seen only when looking back on our lives that we can see it. But we don't just gain a a picture from which to judge based upon our own lives. We have the ability to draw from the experiences of others. It's called the great cloud of witnesses in the Bible. We can see where faith took people. We can see that Abraham's faith was rewarded. He didn't have to sacrifice his son. In every account of the faithfulness of people in the Bible, we get to see a picture of God's faithfulness. Isaac asks, Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for sacrifice? And Abraham's answer is, the Lord will provide. And at that dramatic moment, when Isaac sees nothing but death gleaming off the knife of Abraham, God provides. Isaac, whose death was a sure thing, is released. And the sacrifice that God always meant, the lamb that God provides, is killed instead. In the moment of Abraham's test, God provides. He is true to his promise, and we get to see that. And it should draw us to a greater promise. A promise that God makes to bless all the world through Isaac, that all nations will be blessed through Abraham's son. That it's more than a blessing just for Abraham, it's more than a hope for his family tree, that there's a promise of salvation for all of the world, a promise of survival for all of humanity. And the cost of that blessing comes not to us or to Abraham but to God himself. Isaac asks the most important question in this passage. Where is the lamb? And that question echoes through the pages of the Old Testament. Where is the lamb? And the answer comes thousands of years later. John the Baptist is in the wilderness. And one day Jesus approaches him and John the Baptist says, looking at Jesus, Behold, there is the Lamb. The Lamb that God has provided who takes away the sin of the world. We are all bound by sin. And we sit under the knife of God's judgment. And we wait. We wait for the death, the judgment, The wrath. And yet Jesus comes and takes our place. So that we can live. Jesus is the sacrifice that frees us. He is the one that God provides. So that we can be set free. In Christ we have been freed. In Christ we no longer lay bound under the knife but live free as sons and daughters of God. And in our time of testing, we can rest on that truth and that promise. Pray with me. Lord, help us to understand Help us to find life and freedom in you. Help us to trust you. 
Jesus' name I pray. Amen.